Good afternoon. I'm Ken Weinstein, Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow here at Hudson Institute. I'd like to welcome Josh Rogan to this book forum on the occasion of the publication of his new book, Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, Xi, and the Battle for the 21st Century, published uh, just last week by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Josh uh, needs no introduction here in Washington. His uh, Washington Post uh, Global Opinions column is a must read. He's also well known from his appearances as a CNN political analyst and as a young man, at least young in my, from my standpoint, Josh is someone who's had already a distinguished career writing for such publications as the Daily Beast, Foreign Policy, Bloomberg View, the Asahi Shimbun, and Congressional Quarterly. Now, Chaos Under Heaven, it reads like a novel in many ways. Uh, let me tell us about the book. Where does the title come from? Why did you decide to, to write the book, Josh? Uh, well, thank you so much, Ken, and thanks to everyone at the Hudson Institute. You know, as I was reporting on the story of U.S.-China relations for the Washington Post over the last four years, the Hudson Institute was a, a hugely valuable resource and uh, did a lot of important work to explain what was going on inside the administration, both to Washington audiences and to the world. And I uh, just wanted to thank you for playing that important role. And, uh, you know, when I got to the Washington Post in 2016, it seemed that most of the coverage, the international coverage, especially as Donald Trump was elected president, was focused on Russia. And, uh, you know, it seemed to me that the, the, the story of China's rise and how it was uh, beginning to impact Americans in new and uh, interesting ways, especially uh, inside the government, but not just inside the government, was, was undercovered in the media. So I asked my boss, Fred Hyde, if I could spend the time and resources needed uh, to really dig into this relationship. And he, he uh, to his credit, uh, gave me those time and resources. And I just decided to spend most of my time, you know, in the region with senior officials in Washington, trying to figure out as much as I could, expanding sort of the, the trying to expand the coverage of the US-China relationship beyond the China hands, frankly, and, and trying to connect it to more and more sectors of US society, including academia, Silicon Valley, the tech industry, Hollywood, et cetera. And what I found you know, was that actually all of these sectors were expanding their interest in China at the exact same time, quite uh, irrespective of whatever I was doing. And as I started to cover both the government and all of these sectors of American society, they started interacting with each other. And that also produced uh, sometimes conflicts and sometimes cooperation uh, because of the relationships uh, between the, these sectors of American society and the U.S. government weren't really well established, and some of them had deep skepticism, especially about the Trump administration, but about the federal government overall. And you know, as that was happening, the politics of the China issue became very much part of the U.S. political conversation, and in some ways they got hyper politicized, and in some ways uh, that was uh, uh, um, the fault of both parties, and in some ways uh, that uh, led to Outcome, other outcomes. And finally, when the coronavirus pandemic hit, it became clear to every American, and I would argue every citizen in the world, that what was going on inside of China and the actions of the Chinese government were no longer faraway issues that could be relegated to sort of the ivory tower discussion of uh, academics. And that, you know, all of a sudden there was intense interest amongst people all over the world as to how the Chinese government was operating, both inside of its borders and outside of its borders, but mostly outside of its borders. And that brought the China story to the fore and to the consciousness of basically every human being in the world. And that was when I decided to really sort of go back about, uh, on my reporting of the last four years, do another 300 or so interview and try to document best I could uh, what had happened in US foreign policy and inside the Trump administration during this critical time. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 as you mentioned, there are the, and as your book details through the interviews you did, there are these battle lines in the administration that are pretty, that at times are, are very firm, at times they're shifting. There's changing characters, people coming in and out of the administration. And at the same time, uh, there's a sense that the battlefield, as it were, is it, or the battle lines are expanding, not just that it's, it's not simply uh, a, a, a trade issue, or it's not an issue of currency manipulation, or an issue of purchases of soybeans and wheat. And the, the, I was wondering if you could walk through both the battle lines in the administration, as it were, internally, and the 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 the, the broader China challenge and how they interacted. 
Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think it's important that, you know, what one of the things that the book tries to do is to correct this perception that President Trump didn't know what he was doing on China. And that's to say that, you know, there was this narrative that, you know, this neophyte president who didn't really have a lot of foreign policy experience was bumbling through the most important relationship of the 20th century. And that narrative caught on in the media for a lot of reasons. But when you talk to people who are actually close to the president, they presented an alternative narrative, which is that actually Donald Trump had a very firm and very specific view about uh, China and the US-China relationship. And in fact, what I did, one of the first things I did when writing, the, researching the book was I read every Donald Trump book that he had written that mentioned China for the last 20 years. And I, what I found was um, a remarkable consistency of message, especially on the trade issue. You know, and uh, you could see that those messages in the campaign and in the administration. And so that doesn't mean that there weren't mistakes made. And that doesn't mean that there weren't, uh, you know, uh, times where the president uh, said things or did things related to U.S.-China relationship that veered from that message. But the bottom line is that, you know, rather than the common narrative of the president didn't know anything about China, in fact, he had a firm view about China. And he carried it throughout his career and in, into his presidency. Now, the, the problem, I think, in one sense was that, you know, President Trump never really gave a speech outlining what that vision was. He never really explained it comprehensively to the American people to this day. And we had, you know, I think the highest level speech we ever had was from Vice President Pence, which happened at the Hudson Institute in October 2018. And we had other speeches, Mike Pompeo and Robert O'Brien and, um, you know, the Attorney General and Christopher Ray, the FBI director. Uh, and what I found was that a lot of these were, uh, you know, uh, senior officials who were interpreting and then expressing uh, what they believed the administration's strategy was, and sometimes they aligned and sometimes they didn't. Now, inside the administration, and, you know, there's uh, also this sort of false narrative that there was no strategy. And what I kind of reported out uh, uh, at the time, but then went back over when researching the book, was that actually there were many different strategies and there were many different factions. It wasn't red team, blue team or panda huggers, panda sluggers, or hawks and doves, or any other such simple construction. The fact is that there were several factions, and those factions formed what I call assorted alliances based on overlapping interests, and that those alliances changed over time because the factions changed over time, because there was a, a ton of turnover, and each of these factions had different champions at different times. And so I sort of first identify the super hawks, which are people like Steve Bannon in the beginning, and Peter Navarro, and Stephen Miller to an extent. And uh, these were people who were uh, very intent on confronting the CCP, even taking down the CCP in Bannon's view and Navarro's view. Uh, but there were also economic nationalists who uh, wanted a trade deal uh, structured in a very specific way. They had a, a, a sort of a, a temporary alliance for a time with another group of what I call the hardliners, which are national security and law enforcement and some intelligence professionals who also wanted to take a more hard, uh, more hawkish, I would say more aggressive, competitive stance towards China, but they didn't agree with the super hawks on exactly how to do that. Now, sitting opposed to them, you had uh, the Wall Street clique, which was uh, you know, staffed by a lot of Goldman Sachs executives who brought with them a coterie of billionaires in tow, and they had huge impact and huge influence over the course of the relationship quite in the other direction, in the interest of the business sector and in the interests of Wall Street and the interests of more integration and more access. And they steered the trade talks in a certain way. And then you had certain uh, individual figures who didn't fit into any one camp necessarily. Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, was probably the most influential advisor on China to the president because he was the closest to the president. And his agenda, his goal was to get the president what he wanted, which was a deal. And he worked very hard to do that. And Michael Pillsbury, a, a historian, uh, became a, a unique Trump whisperer on China. And he had very high access. And he also traveled several times to Beijing to try to explain the Trump uh, White House and President Trump to the Chinese leadership. And uh, this, uh, he was also very uh, deeply involved in the transition. Uh, but he never joined any one of these factions. And uh, he, he never, until the very end, had a job, uh, a position inside the administration, but he had influence nonetheless. So I think that's a, it's a more complicated picture than most people realize. And when it comes to the trade deal, and we can get into this a little bit more, but basically what I would say is that, you know, and in the book, David Fife, a former Wall Street Journal uh, uh, columnist who was working in the State Department is quoted as putting forth this idea, which I largely agree with, which is that, you know, the media covered the trade negotiations as if it was sort of the 
totality of what was going on in the U.S.-China relationship, because that was the thing that was moving. That was the thing that was in the news. He called it like the weather, you know, whereas the, the broad change in U.S.-China relations was more like the climate, you know, and it's easy to cover the weather, but it's hard to cover the change in the climate. But in the end, over time, climate change is much more significant than any shifts in the weather from day to day. So what I tried to do here was to connect what we've all seen as the cover of the coverage of the weather in U.S.-China relations with the change of climate, which happened mostly behind the scenes. And then the, cli the climate change, is, as David put it, as you put it, it's, it's quite dramatic. Uh, even before COVID-19, uh, the, 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 some of the positions that were held by uh, some members of the Wall Street faction, for example, those were largely discredited long before COVID, uh, when there just became this increasing knowledge of what China was, was up to. Uh, when you, you talk about the, uh, the greater knowledge of uh, the China, uh, the Made in China 2025 program, the greater knowledge about uh, the United Front efforts, the efforts of um, uh, various organs of the, the Communist Party to influence uh, both uh, US opinion leaders, US thinkers, uh, business elites, and that, uh, and that there was, it, the, the change in climate was, was, was quite dramatic. Let me ask you to hypothesize, what, in a, in a, had Hillary Clinton been elected president in 2016, might that have happened? Uh, to be sure, if Hillary Clinton had been elected president, the, the, the policies would have been different, the strategies would have been different, the personnel would have been different. Uh, and I think, you know, but I do not think that she would have been able to continue what many saw in the Obama administration as a largely engagement focused, largely risk averse, largely confrontation averse uh, policy. In other words, you know, what we're seeing in the Biden administration right now, and I know we'll get to this later, but very briefly, uh, is uh, uh, something in between where the Obama administration was, you can say, and where the Trump administration ended up. And that means a competitive based approach that sort of uh, is clear-eyed about the, the activities of the Chinese leadership, but is not, does not go so far as to push every button that we can find in order to uh, push back as much as possible. And I think that's exactly what the Chinese leadership was expecting, in fact. And there's a story in the book about how they met with Susan Rice and John Kerry one week before the 2016 election and were reassured that the basic stance of the uh, and trajectory of the U.S.-China relationship would continue. And of course, uh, everyone was surprised. I was surprised. Maybe you were surprised when Trump won. And this just threw a huge amount of uh, uh, disruption and unpredictability into the calculations. And, you know, I think in a sense, we're getting back to what we would have seen in a Hillary Clinton administration, because when you have figures like Jake Sullivan and uh, Kurt Campbell in charge of the policy, those are people who have a long history of working with Hillary and are a little bit more competitive focused than some of the Obama officials that preceded them. Now, What's really interesting, I think, is that you know when the Trump administration came in, uh, and there, there, the the campaign rhetoric, which was very hawkish and was written mostly by Navarro and Stephen Miller uh, and others, uh, was initially tossed aside. And you know, for the first month or so, uh, the Wall Street clique actually had more control over the policy, and that's why we saw a lot of the things that we saw. And you know, and then as the weather got stormier, as the Trade, trade negotiations got worse and worse, what Trump, President Trump would do is he would lift the, the ceiling on what the hardliners and hawks could try to accomplish. And, and we would sort of seesaw a little bit back and forth between uh, a space for more confrontational policies. And then when we would get close to a deal or something like that, the space would dry up. And this was complicated to a significant degree by President Trump's personal relationship with Xi Jinping, which is the book it uh, explains in uh, uh, detail had had a, a, a very complicating effect on what the officials were doing. Now, the trade deal, actually, if you think about it, when it was signed on January 15th at the White House, uh, represented, you know, set aside the merits of the of the of the numbers and the soybeans represented a detente that President Trump very clearly uh, believed was about to start. And he believed that the confrontation was over and he in his speech on January 15th in the East Wing of the White House, announced a new era of peace and coexistence with, between the US and China. Uh, and that was what was written on the paper in front of him. That's what he said. And only two days later, information about the virus started pouring in. And that sort of detente lasted about two days. And then, you know, after the virus hit, 
uh, for a time, as the book details, uh, President Trump continued to believe his good friend Xi Jinping, or at least wanted to believe his good friend Xi Jinping that this was under control. In two separate phone calls in February and March, President Xi told Trump that it was under control, that herbal medicine would cure it, that it would go away when it got warmer, and several other lines. And this fed into a, a, you know, a process inside the White House that delayed a, more, a stronger response and contributed to the suffering of Americans. Of course, the Chinese government did this with countries all over the world. And then in March and April, uh, the Chinese government blackmailed the United States government with our PPE and our masks uh, in order to pressure the, the United States government to shut up about its conduct related to the virus. And you know, by the time it became clear to the president and everyone around him that this was not going away and that the Chinese government had committed all of these sins and lied to the president of the United States, it was too late and our response was uh, uh, woefully uh, inadequate. And uh, I think this turned the president against his uh, friend Xi Jinping. And as we saw on the campaign trail, he uh, uh, turned to a much harsher rhetoric in that uh, the US-China relationship just fell down from there. So, you know, it, again, it's complicated. I think that at times the hawks and hardliners were on top. At times the Wall Street click got its way. The deal itself represented a victory by those who wanted more integration. Uh, but the pandemic changed everything, you know, and uh, that's where we are right now. So let, let me ask you, since you mentioned the president and your, your take on the president's uh, attitude towards, uh, towards Xi Jinping, let me, let me ask you, I want to take the book about in a slightly different direction. Uh, uh, you, you call your book a first draft of history, in a sense, and uh, uh, I'd like to sort of get you to reflect on, on your first draft. Uh, you know, all reporters in some sense are, are prisoners of their sources in some ways. Uh, sure. I, you, you, you sort of try to open the aperture further to, to test, you know, which, which sources can be, which sources are more credible, which ones are, are less. And you, you yourself, you, you, you referenced the, the Rashomon movie, uh, you know, and the different perceptions you can have of the same scene. Uh, and in particular, I, I, I was wondering, uh, what do you, you know, what, what did you do in particular to sort of broaden the aperture when you were talk, talking to the sources, knowing that in a sense, they all are self-interested? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. You know, uh, in any uh, reporting endeavor, uh, what, as Bob Woodward likes to say, what you try to get is the best obtainable version of the truth. And the integrity is in seeking that best obtainable version. And, you know, I had reported most of these stories over the course of those four years. And when I sat down to write the book during my quarantine, uh, I, I did as many interviews as I could, and then I collected as many firsthand documents as I could, and I compared them to as much of the other reporting by other, you know, prominent journalists who have been covering this at the same time for other publications. And, uh, and you know, I think the uh, part of the integrity is in uh, acknowledging what you don't know. And there were a lot of puzzles in the Trump administration's China strategy that I wasn't able to solve given the amount of time and resources that I had. And, you know, for example, you know, there's a story about how the Taiwan call with uh, President Tsai Ing-wen came to be. And that story that I laid out in the book is quite different from the story that you read in the New York Times. And in the book, I even lay out that even firsthand sources, people who were in the room and directly involved, disagreed about what had gone down on that fateful day. And so that's how I presented it as the official story that you've read. It's certainly not the end of the story, but even today, uh, there's a dispute, frankly, amongst the people inside the administration as to what happened. And so, you know, you, you, you try to focus on the documents, you try to get as many firsthand sources as possible, you try to get as many sources as possible on the record. And I think, you know, be, the, the added trick of the Trump administration was that there was a lot of, frankly, disinformation put out and there was a lot of sloppy reporting at the time, uh, because there was a lot of tension between the Trump administration and the press, but you know, I, uh, as I say in the book, I thank the a lot of Trump administration officials for taking a big, big risk in providing me with information and documents at a time when they didn't really have to do that, right? Because they wanted people to know what had happened, and you know, historians will surely pour over a lot of these reports, including my book, of course, and uh, and build upon that body of knowledge. Well, what I sought to do here was, you know, use my time and resources to dig up as much verifiable information as possible, and uh, you know. To be sure, there's a lot more out there for future books. Yeah, what, 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 I, one person you don't interview is, is the president, <clears throat> unless I'm mistaken. And yeah. uh, I, I guess Bob Davis and Leland Wang and their superpower showdown, their sources differ a bit from yours, and they also spent 
And they, they go on about how Trump micromanaged the China relationship. He calls Xi Jinping, I think, 30 times. He micromanaged the trade relationships. And Davis spends time with the president, as did Bob Woodward. Uh, and I'm wondering, if you, if you had spent time with the president, what would you have asked him? <laughs> well, you know, I would have, you know, uh, so I, the interviews that I have that were on the record include, uh, you know, Vice President Pence, sure. Ambassador Haley, uh, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, Matt Pottinger, Steve Bannon, uh, and uh, many other, Mark Esper, uh, uh, and I, I traveled around the region with, with Pence several times and with Esper. Uh, I spoke with Mike Pompeo, John Bolton. So I, I feel like I had a, a very high level, uh, a broad range of firsthand sources. And that's just the top of the administration because of course, a lot of the reporting is what was happening down beneath the administration. And again, I think we can focus too much on the top five people without realizing that there's 300 people who have influence in the levels below them. And that, so that, that, that's actually you know, about the number of people that I spoke to uh, uh, who, who are not in the cabinet. You know, if I had a chance to, uh, to sit with President Trump, I would have uh, asked him uh, very frankly uh, whether or not he uh, uh, believes that the trade deal fixed any of the problems that he has been railing against for the last 30 years. In other words, you know, what I saw consistently in his writing and even in his books was that the president believes in his heart of hearts that uh, the uh, uh, China, Chinese, Chinese government has been screwing over the American economy and American workers. And at the end of the day, the, does the trade deal that he signed and trumpeted uh, rectify any of that? And I would be interested in his honest opinion about that. Now, it's also clear from the record that he didn't care much about the issues of values promotion and human rights. And I would ask him if looking back, maybe he thought that was a wasted opportunity. In other words, you don't have to care about human rights for the sake of human rights, although I, I do think that should stand on its own merit. But uh, there was always a, 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 a pattern of, of, of people in his administration asking him to use this, these issues as leverage, as parts of the puzzle, as things that you know, the America could incorporate into its strategy in a smart way. And a lot of those were missed opportunities. I, I'm, I would wonder if he would think about that. And also, I would wonder you know, what he really thought about his interactions with Xi Jinping, because you know, even if we don't really, there were 30 letters and phone calls, and I have readouts of the letters, I'm sorry, readouts of the phone calls in the book, um, you know, and there, there are bits and pieces of it, but you know, it would be nice to know uh, what, what a little bit more about you know, what President Trump learned over those four years. Where did he start and where did he end up and was that a different place? Very interesting. I'm talking about where we started, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by your story of the origin of President Trump's China policy. And you, you, you mentioned you went through all 12 of his books in which he explicitly mentions the China challenge in terms of trade, global competition, and even talks about the, the, you know, the challenge, uh, the undemocratic character of the People's Republic of China and, and what that means. Um, and you cite uh, Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger's uh, very influential two, 2015 memo, Bill's paper, which you argue lays out the themes the administration would follow. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear you go through some of those themes for our audience. And, and also, let me ask you, in that same vein, you mentioned my Hudson colleague, uh, Mike Pillsbury, numerous times as uh, President Trump's uh, favorite China expert. Uh, and uh, late in the administration, Mike was both appointed chairman of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board. He also received notification that he would be named ambassador to China in the second term, received word from the White House uh, of, of this, uh, this appointment. And his, his 2015 best-selling book, uh, The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Plan to Replace America as the Global Superpower, was arguably the most important book about China strategy in decades, uh, just a, a phenomenon in, in every way, including in the administration. I just, you know, almost every time I would interact with a cabinet official, they, they would tell me how they just finished reading Mike's book. Um, you know, Vice President cited it in the speech at Hudson Institute. You mentioned the October 2018 speech. Uh, the president was photographed with it, and that was. Wondering if you could walk through uh, both the the paper and Mike's book and their influence. Yeah, well, first of all, Ken, I would say you just uh, broke some news there. The uh, the fact that you're reporting uh, uh, that uh, that Mike Pillsbury was offered and notified that he would be the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to China in the second term. Uh, I haven't seen that reported publicly anywhere. So 
Uh, for all you viewers out there, uh, I may be the journalist, but uh, Ken Weinstein just broke some news on this Zoom right now. And I find that to be fascinating, actually. And, you know, I think when you talk about um, uh, uh, Pottinger and Pillsbury, uh, it's important to remember how they came onto the scene. And this was the day after the Tsai Ing-wen phone call during the transition, Mike Flynn and Katie McFarlane realized that they didn't have a China team, right? They had, you know, Wilbur Ross and they had Peter Navarro, but they didn't, it wasn't enough. They needed some backup. And so they called Pillsbury and Pondra. They were the first two China experts called in uh, after the, who weren't already on the campaign. And uh, Pillsbury, uh, you know, and Pondra showed up the next day and they got to work. And what they did was, I mean, it, it's a long story, but basically what they did was they started to coalesce uh, the papers and documents and sit in a room and, and get together and, and come up with the, what were the beginnings of a China strategy. You know, Pottinger had already had thought about this in his head extensively. And what he had come up with was a 12 page memo, which he called Bill's paper. Now there was no bill. He saved it on his computer as Bill's paper because he didn't want anyone searching his computer to, you know, know what it was. He wanted, it was, it was a little bit of subterfuge as a former intelligence officer. He liked that kind of thing. And, uh, and this paper was laid out, it was, it was, it was called a, 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 a rebalance of power in Asia. And it was based on the premise that, you know, the United States and China had, uh, uh, that the relationship had fundamentally changed and that the balance was shifting out of whack and not in our favor and that a new strategy was needed to restore that balance to avoid the conflict that neither side wants. And uh, this paper uh, included it basically said, don't think of China as the sun. Think of China as Jupiter, one large and important but not central planet in a constellation that is Asia. And he encouraged a focus on those frontline states in Asia and a re-engagement of those states in a common interest. And uh, then he talked about a lot of things that a lot of people weren't talking about at the time, like Chinese influence operations, Chinese interference operations, um, the United Front, and the emerging 5G problems, semiconductors, you name it. And when Pottinger became the uh, NSC senior director for Asia on day one, he brought that paper, that 12 page memo in and, and that became the beginning. He shared it with the staff. That became the beginning of the effort which was later joined by many others including H.R. McMaster and Nadia Shadlow and several others of what would then become two classified strategies about China which then would become uh, uh, parts of the national defense strategy and the national security strategy, and finally an Indo-Pacific strategy that was released by the administration in January 2020. So the seeds of this climate change, the big shift in U.S. foreign policy, were planted on a one. Now Pot Pillsbury did not go into the administration uh, for a variety of reasons, but he remained close. And uh, you know, not only did he travel back and forth to Beijing to help explain Trump to the Chinese leadership and try to change, uh, tr tr uh, uh, and help the Chinese leadership understand Trump. Uh, he ma he maintained very close contacts with the president himself and senior leaders. And you know the China hand community in Washington was very as much of the foreign policy elite in Washington was very anti-Trump in a large degree because they he you know most of the Trump people weren't from this uh, community and so. Uh, Pillsbury provided a rare and important link. And especially for people in think tank world who uh, wanted to know what was going on inside the Trump administration, uh, Pillsbury became an important link to them as well. And I remember very distinctly at the Aspen Security Forum in January, 2020, uh, right before the pandemic and Pillsbury was explaining uh, Trump's uh, uh, China approach. Uh, and the moderator said, well, you know, it's clear that, uh, you know, the 100 year marathon has become uh, um, the most important book to read to understand how the Trump administration uh, was dealing with China. Now, my personal view is that it was a very important, but one of several things that was going on. It wasn't, you know, we know that uh, people like James Mattis read it. We know, of course, that uh, Pence read it. I don't know if Trump read it, but, you know, he, he was aware of it. But the point is not just that the book became part of the, 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 the ethos and, the, and, the, and the, the discussion of US policy. It was that Pillsbury himself uh, maintained that relationship and uh, at various points in the story uh, had more sort of access and influence with Trump than was otherwise widely known. You know, I mean, M Mike would regularly, and not breaking news here, the president would regularly call him for advice on critical issues at critical moments, would welcome him into the That's White true. House to talk about issues and, and single him out in the 
uh, numerous uh, numerous times publicly uh, and and on Twitter, uh, praising him uh, for his for his contributions. Uh, let me let me ask you about uh, and one of the big themes of the book, as you mentioned, is the uh, is this quest to produce the equivalent of the George Kennan, the uh, either George Kennan's famous X article in Foreign Affairs that uh, came to shape Cold War strategy and or NSC sixty eight, which really reshape U.S. government institutions to meet the challenge. And you note there were numerous efforts inside the Trump administration to uh, create, uh, to either do the X article or to uh, create NSC 68, but none of them quite gelled. And I was wondering why that is or why that was. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, and Ken, you know this so well, in Washington, there's a lot of ahistoric, you know, discussion of what really happened with Kennan in the Letter X and the long telegram, and you know it's often summed up in in Washington discussions as well. Kennan created the strategy of containment, and containment won the Cold War. So Kennan won the Cold War. So we need another Kennan and another long telegram. And often the discussion kind of doesn't get to the next level of nuance, which is simply that you know Kennan actually disagreed with much of the Cold War strategy that his successors implemented, especially through NS68 and Paul Nietzsche. And uh, he was uh, on the outside for most of that and a heavy critic of the militarization of the Cold War. Uh, and also, you know, the fact is that, you know, uh, nobody really can agree on exactly why it is that we won the Cold War. Was it the complicated, you know, uh, set of, of, of Helsinki Accord diplomacy that roped the Soviet Union into a series of commitments? Or was it the Soviet, Un the Russian people's struggle for the fresh air of freedom, or was it, did we outspend them? Did we cut off their capital? I think all of those things are part of the story, but suffice to say, when it comes to the discussion of China and uh, Kennan and, and the Cold War, we often get a very simplistic reading. And I think that's what we saw at a specific um, um, uh, think tank event that I detail in my book, where uh, the State Department's policy planning director in 2019, I believe, was uh, a woman named Kieran Skinner is very accomplished academic uh, who said that she was writing a, a letter X for the Trump administration. And, you know, that not only sort of misremembers which document Kennan was writing inside the administration, but it also happened not to work because she created an unfortunate scandal, as you may remember, by uh, making some remarks that were very uh, off putting. And, and then she was later. Uh, um, asked to leave the State Department and the whole project inside the Pompeo State Department about creating a long telegram or a letter X was sort of changed and diluted. And it, it turned into what were a series of speeches that were written by, you know, Miles Yu and Mary Kissel and some others. And the work wasn't wasted, but the State Department never produced a long telegram, much less a letter X. And, you know, sort of, I sort of explain this by saying that, you know, in a 2016, 2019, 2021 environment, there is no real uh, possible way to write one explanatory document that will uh, encapsulate that situation that we're in. There is no canon. There is no long telegram. Uh, there are a lot of people with a lot of really good ideas and who are trying to stab at this problem, but it's the, the situation is more complicated. Uh, the voices are more diverse. Uh, there's, there's just, we don't live in that kind of environment anymore where one diplomat can write one document. Nevertheless, it hasn't stopped a lot of people from trying. And, you know, when Pottinger wanted to put forth his vision, based on Bill's paper, actually, he had this idea to put out a long te a telegram uh, or, or a letter X. And remember, the long telegram was the internal document, and the letter X was the external facing document and, and that was produced, at, that was written in Foreign Affairs. Uh, but he wasn't in a position to do that. So he turned to his friend, Congressman Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, who was from the same exact district that Kennan was from. And they worked together uh, to produce what they thought was uh, a, a letter X, a public facing explanation of quote unquote, the sources of CCP conduct. Their theory of the case of why the Chinese Communist Party acts the way that it does, what's behind it? And what does that mean for what we have to do about it? And they pitched it to foreign affairs, but were rejected. So it ended up coming up, coming out in another magazine. And then, you know, over the last four years, we've seen, you know, I, if you Google the sources of CCP conduct, there's probably two or three dozen stabs at it. Uh, that's a long way of saying there will be no uh, long telegram. There will be no letter X for China. There probably will be no 
George Kennan. It's a it's a, a a challenge and a problem that we're all going to have to sort of work together on, and we're all going to have to uh, share information on without looking off of one particular document one way or the other. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, let me ask you, uh, you know, uh, where you see who did China want to see win the election in twenty twenty one, and why? Uh, you know, in the run up to the 2020 election, um, uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence put out a statement saying clearly that uh, it was the intelligence community's belief that the Chinese leadership preferred that Joe Biden win the election over President Trump because of, quote unquote, President Trump's unpredictability. And that represented uh, a a, a peek inside what was going on inside, in, inside the intelligence community, but not the totality of it. And that statement became sort of highly politicized. And you know what we what I saw reporting in the 2020 election was that, on the one hand, the Chinese government was uh, producing a, a ton of propaganda and uh, um, troll factories and bots and state media attacking the Trump administration. It seemed pretty clear. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of uh, uh, propaganda and interference and uh, and misinformation just to sow discord in our system. So uh, it would be incorrect to say that they put all their chips on Joe Biden. And it would be more correct to say that while they attacked President Trump more than Joe Biden, uh, their real goal, similarly to the Russians in 2016, was to undermine the case for U.S. democracy by uh, undermining integrity of our system. That continues to be one of their goals to this day. Let, let me ask you about the Biden team and how, how much of a priority do you see China being for them? Uh, you know, this weekend, we see uh, Secretary of State Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan are going to be in Alaska to meet with uh, Yang uh, Zixi, the Chinese official who figures in the uh, first page of uh, the prologue of your book, uh, an official who John Kerry had to his house in Boston for a couple of days and trying to work out uh, a relationship of cooperation with uh, with the Chinese and wondering uh, where do you see their policy going? What what the fault lines are going to be? Right. I, you know, first of all, what we, I've identified a few different camps on China inside the Biden administration. On the one hand, you have uh, optimists, people who are very much pro engagement and have been the whole time. And you could put uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry in this camp, and he's literally sitting in the State Department right now with a huge suite of offices trying to make uh, progress on things with China uh, related to climate change. Then you have uh, what I call the competitors. And these are people who have a, a more hawkish view of the relationship, but not quite as far as you saw from a lot of Trump administration officials. And this would include Jake Sullivan and Anthony Blinken and Kirk Campbell. And uh, the third group, of course, are the political people. And the political people are not necessarily as interested in the US-China dynamics as they are in protecting the president and his administration. And, uh, right now, and two out of three wins the day, and right now, because the political incentives and the political wins are very clear, and the American people, according to all the polls, Democrats and Republicans alike, are calling for a tougher China policy, uh, not only because of the pandemic, but partially because of the pandemic. Um, and so right now, the, the competitors are, are have the reins of the relationship. And, uh, what we see them doing is very interesting, right? We see them basically ignoring the Chinese leadership. I mean, this meeting, they didn't take a call for a while. This meeting that's happening in Alaska uh, is uh, 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 being, uh, the expectations are being set extremely low and not, we're being told not to expect any deliverables. Whereas the meetings before them with the Japanese and South Korean leaders are, are expected to produce a lot more results. We had a quad meeting amongst the four presidents. Uh, we're seeing a, a South Korea trade deal. Uh, the Japanese prime minister will be the first foreign leader to visit uh, the White House. This is not an accident. They are placing all of their chips on the allies and strengthening those relationships. And that's part of a, partially, according to my sources, a direct message to Beijing that uh, it will not be a return to business as usual like they were used to in 2016. And that if they do want to have construction, constructive relationships with the Biden administration, they are going to have to make some changes. That's what I was told, that the message in Alaska is uh, you're going to have to do some things differently if you want to have a constructive relationship with the United States, which is on the table, but not under the current terms. And that 
uh, is not a message that Beijing seems to have received or uh, because what everything that we see coming out of Beijing is just attacks, attacks, attacks. So I, I, I also think that the real uh, ch uh, challenges inside the administration on China have yet to really uh, uh, bear out. And we'll see, we, we haven't had a clash of priorities where you have the climate change agenda and the national security agenda, but heads in a real way where the president of the United States is forced to make a decision between one or the other. And I think that's when the, that's when you'll, the rubber will meet the road and we'll find out really uh, how far they're willing to go and what their priorities are. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, the notion, yeah, the climate change dangle of sort of trying to draw in. Uh, yeah, the there's always a dangle. Is the, is, is, you know, is, is the $64,000 question. And uh, Iran and North Korea and all, anything else that the Chinese leadership uh, well, can dangle in front of the Biden administration, they will try to dangle. And I think that, you know, the Biden, Kirk Campbell and Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan are very well aware of this dynamic. Okay. So they're not going to get tricked into anything at all. But at the same time, you know, this uh, sort of stance of engaging robustly with allies, but sort of giving the Chinese leadership the, the Heisman, the, 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 the push away, uh, that can't last forever. At some time, they're going to have to deal with the Chinese directly and, and sit down so more substantively than they will this week in Alaska. And I don't think they really know what they're gonna do yet. I think that's still a matter of intense discussion inside the administration. And let me ask you about the, the transformation within China, which, uh, uh, which, which a lot of which has been the driver for what's happened on our side. Um, how you view that transformation, where you think it's heading? Uh, it seems that um, at the end of the Trump administration, several senior officials came to believe that this more aggressive U.S. approach, in other words, the United States changed its behavior in order to place Ch the Chinese leadership to a choice. And the, the intention was to, to signal to the Chinese leadership that you, you, you now have two choices. You can uh, back off some of your most egregious sins and your most, egre your most malign actions, or if you insist on continuing to, you know, steal intellectual property and uh, uh, commit genocide and uh, expand authoritarianism worldwide and 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 do all sorts of other unfair trade practices, the costs will be higher. So we changed our behavior, our behavior in order to put them to a choice. And what it seems, I mean, from every indication that I've seen, is that the Chinese government has not changed its behavior in the way that we wanted, right? In fact, they've doubled down. In fact, when you listen to Xi Jinping talk, he talks about speeding up and uh, standing strong against this new uh, US stance. Uh, so you can look at that as we forced the Chinese government to uh, be more bold and in some cases make more mistakes. And we see that in the vaccines and in the masks and in the, in the COVID diplomacy. Uh, China's, the Chinese government's sort of uh, bullying tactics have had a backlash. So uh, there are a lot of people inside the Trump administration who, who say, well, that we helped cause that because uh, now we've, we've exposed in a way uh, their strategy and forced them to speed it up ahead of our response. Um, but I, I, I and, and that goes with a, a sort of conclusion that may, perhaps the Chinese government uh, doesn't have the capability to change its behavior in a way that we want. In other words, who in that system is able to tell Xi Jinping that he's doing something wrong? Who, who are all of the internal feedback and dissent mechanisms inside the leadership of the CCP have been largely disabled, right? I mean, I think that's a, a could, almost a consensus position. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge problem, you know, and it, you know, there are some people inside the Trump administration and in the Biden administration who want to bet on the reformers, who want to play inside Chinese politics because why wouldn't you try, right? Why wouldn't you try to mess with their heads a little bit by promoting the people inside their system who are more amenable to the things that we want? Um, but it, it just doesn't seem increasingly that that is working because uh, those people are either uh, dead or in jail or smart enough to shut up. Yeah, let, let, me, let, let me ask you how, how China became a political football and, and you go through it in okay. the book. Uh, this in, in this election season because it, it really it obviously was the big issue in the uh, 2020 campaign in some way um, certainly the big foreign policy issue and uh, 
Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, you know, as the pandemic set in and as the election 2020 election season ramped up, you know, both both parties abused the China issue uh, in the 2020 election cycle, but in different ways. You know, the Trump administration ramped up the anti-China rhetoric, especially on the campaign trail. But back in Congress, Nancy Pelosi told her members not to cooperate with Republicans on any China related legislation. I remember a funny story, which was that I was about to write an article about a China task force, a bipartisan task force that Democratic and Republican staffers had been working on for over a year. And it was to bring together all of the committees of interest uh, to have hearings and craft legislation that would elevate the China issue uh, to the top of the congressional agenda and organize it in a way that we could get things done. And Democratic and Republican staffers alike were very proud of their work on this because they saw it as the best way to make the China issue bipartisan. And the night before it was to be announced, the, ver the late that night, I got a call from a Democratic staffer who said, we're pulling out, it's over, we're not gonna do it. They had received word from their leadership not to cooperate with Republicans on any China stuff. This was February, 2020. Uh, so the, the, the fact is that both parties have made mistakes in politicizing the China issue. I do think that you know, the, 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 the rhetoric that was used, uh, by, especially by Republicans, but not only by Republicans, uh, did feed into a, 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 set, a, a pattern of uh, increasing uh, hate and attacks against Asian Americans. And that's something that we all have to stand against and we have to excise from our political discussion. And it's important to say that as much as possible. But what the book is, is a call for a depoliticization of the China issue and a shared understanding that this is a shared challenge that affects not only every American, but every citizen around the world. A shared challenge, uh, indeed. Um, look, Josh, let me thank you for uh, your time. Thank you for uh, going through your book. Again, the book is uh, Chaos Under Heaven, and it uh, reads like a novel, as I said. And uh, you, as we said earlier, you described your book as a first draft of history. And I look forward to seeing the second draft and the third draft uh, in your column each week in the Washington Post, and uh, eventually look forward to uh, the sequel. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.